Okay. Let's move this. All right. Let's see. Wednesday the sixth. So we're now just a little over a week away from the last day of class. <laughs> All right. A little giddy about that, but then that's also scary. A lot to do between now and then. Mm. Okay. So we left off with this, right? We're talking just vocab, lots of vocab. Um, this chapter, there's really kind of one, only one pathway, and it's hardly a pathway. It's not as complex as the ones you've already learned, uh, but it's mostly vocab. In the next chapter, the immune system, there are, I'll say, two pathways. And then the reproductive, yeah, maybe one, but you've already learned it in the endocrine system, so it'll be reviewed. So we're not going to have as many pathways for the rest of the semester. Okay. All right. Um, any questions before I get going on the exam that's coming up on Friday? All right. Obviously, none of this is on. It. You guys feel ready? Okay, good. Okay, so more vocab. So I'm going to talk about the nephron next. And so I'm going to use these abbreviations because it's easier than saying it out. So the proximal convoluted tubule, just call it the PCT. The loop of Henle, just the loop. And the distal convoluted tubule, just the DCT. It's much easier. So descriptor. So if you didn't learn this in anatomy, this is fine. This is kind of really the realm of physiology. So for some of you, it might review, review but others, it might be blend, brand new. This thing right here, if I get my pen awake, is the nephron, OK? This is one nephron and you have billions of them in your kidney tubules, okay? So when I talked about last time, the afferent arterial, that is where substances enter the nephron. And so the yellow thing really is the nephron, all right? So arterial blood comes in through here. This yellow cap is called the Bowman's capsule. Inside, you can barely make out, there's like a network of capillaries. So remember the lab where we did the osmosis and diffusion, and we used the, um, the tube where we put the glucose and the starch in, right, the dialysis tube, and stuff could pass through that tube if it was small enough. That's called filtration, but we didn't call it that because it wasn't pressure. We called it diffusion. But here in this example, arterial blood coming in comes in under pressure. Arterial blood's got pressure. So this is the example of passive transport known as filtration. So it's the force of the arterial blood that pushes small things through this network of capillaries called the glomerulus. And what makes it through those holes has now been filtered. And so it's called filtrate. And so that filtrate makes it through the first convoluted part of the nephron is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Then it goes down into a loop that descends and then ascends. And then there's another distal convoluted tubule right here, and then it meets with a collecting duct. If the substances going into the glomerulus are too large, any cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, even platelets, large, um, you know, large like polysaccharides like starches or glycogen, um, large proteins, okay, anything that's large gets immediately rejected and it leaves through the efferent arterial, which merges with this network of capillaries around the nephron called the peritubular capillaries. Peri means around and tubular means tube, literally means capillaries surrounding the nephron tube. And that is how those substances just get sent back into circulation. All right. Okay. So I like to think of the nephron as like a big snake. I'm not afraid of snakes. If you are, then don't think of it as that. But this looks like the head of the snake. And inside its mouth is that capillary uh, network known as the glomerulus, and then it's convoluted, all right? So we're gonna talk about later on um, the effect of hormones on what is retained or reabsorbed 
from your kidneys. And when I say that, it's from these nephrons. So what's a hormone that you studied in the kidney lab that can influence water retention, especially if you ate or drank something really salty? ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So we're gonna talk about that later on. The collecting duct is where ADH has its effect and water is reabsorbed from that duct, goes back into the circulation. And we know that ADH will dilute the salts in your blood, bringing your osmolarity back down. Okay, what is an end product of renin secretion when your blood pressure is too low going into the kidneys? The JGA senses it, because this has been the on the exam. Secretes renin, renin goes into the bloodstream. What's the first organ that renin approaches that's gonna start a conversion, a chemical conversion of substances? Because I could ask that on the exam. I could say, where is it that this gets converted to that? If you've been studying, renin gets in the blood. What's the first organ on this trip to produce this end product that can retain salt? Oh, another L word, the liver. The liver converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. I know where you need to study. All right, now angiotensin 1 is in the bloodstream. Now it goes to the other L word, the lungs, which has ACE angiotensin converting enzyme. It converts angiotensin one to angiotensin two, which can cause your arteries to clamp down and increase blood pressure. But angiotensin two is not done there. It's gonna to go to another set of organs, endocrine organs that lie on top of your um, kidneys. The, what, what are those glandular things on top of your kidneys? Your adrenal glands. Your adrenal cortex is gonna to respond to angiotensin two by producing the hormone that can cause you to retain salt and it's got the letters for salt in the name, aldosterone. And aldosterone causes in the DCT, salt to be returned to the bloodstream. And then water follows that salt back into the bloodstream. That makes your blood volume go up and your blood pressure go up. So see how I built stories over chapters and now I'm showing you, oh, this is where those hormones have their effect. All right, so I've added something new onto it. Okay. So I've got some gifts to help you here. So blood enters, arterial en uh, enters the um, afferent arterial. So it's a very, very small artery. All right. Into the, basically the head of the snake with the network of capillaries called the glomerulus. If it makes it through the small pores in the glomerulus, it becomes filtrate. It enters through the PCT, goes down the loop, up the loop, goes to the DCT, goes to the collecting duct. But it starts with entry. So the entry, this is the afferent arterial and not shown in the head of the snake are small pores in this membrane. And if it's small enough, stuff makes it through the pores. And now this is filtrate right here. So what's the filtrate? It's primarily gonna be water, a lot of water. It's gonna be salts. It's going to be some ions. It's going to be glucose. That's a valuable nutrient your body doesn't wanna lose in the urine. Small proteins like amino acids and some other things and some pharmacological agents too that people are taking prescribed medications. If it's too large to make it through the pores, it gets ejected out the uh, efferent arterial and then merges back with the body's circulatory system. So that's what's going on, right? So that's the glomerulus in here. This is the Bowman's capsule that surrounds it. Sound familiar for some of you from anatomy if you've covered that? Okay. Okay, so we'll wait for this to start over again, but it all starts here. And if it makes it through, it gets through the PCT, the descending loop of Henle, ascending loop of Henle, the DCT, then to the collecting duct. And so that's how it's going, all right? So this filtration is happening 24-7, 365. You are producing urine 24-7, 365, all right? Okay, so in reabsorption, water salts, small proteins, glucose, all that stuff. Um, so this is supposed to be the PCT and it's showing things being reabsorbed into a capillary that's back in the circulatory system. Notice glucose, amino acids, and salt, okay? If salt is reabsorbed, water will be reabsorbed with that salt. Water doesn't move anywhere in your body unless there's some sort of solute like salt or sugars or things like that, that cross a membrane, making one side of the membrane hypertonic then water will always follow across that membrane to dilute those solutes. 
Water must move where there is a salt or a sugar gradient. Remember the egg, okay? You put the egg in a high sugar solution and then water left the egg, right? If you put the egg in pure water, now the interior of the egg is hypertonic, water crosses the egg membrane and fills the egg up with water. So that's the same concept that you did in lab, but this is what's happening in your kidneys, all right? So when I talk about at the very end of the chapter, how diuretics work. Diuretics are prescribed for many reasons. If someone's got edema in their body because maybe they have some cardiovascular insufficiency and they have fluid that builds up in their lower limbs and things like that, if you give them a diuretic, they will pee out body water and get rid of that extra fluid, okay? Another reason to give diuretics is high blood pressure, one of the big three, right? Diuretics all act at the kidneys and diuretics prevent you from retaining salt. They make you pee out salt and then water follows salt out in your urine and that drops your blood volume and blood pressure. So this movement of salt, wherever salt goes, water is going to follow it. That's just a hard and fast rule of physiology. Okay, so that was anatomy review. Some of you didn't have that in anatomy, so I understand it's new. So more vocab, just more of the same, same image. So know what the glomerulus is. It's this network inside the head of the snake. The head of the snake is the Bowman's capsule. It just surrounds it. And then of course, I'll have a slide later on. What makes it through the glomerulus is called filtrate. So lots of vocab, mostly vocab in this chapter. So this is gonna come to a nursing application here. Glomerular filtration rate. How much of arterial blood is filtered through the glomerulus and goes through your nephrons? That filtration rate is usually constant within a certain normal range of arterial blood pressure. Now you turned in your blood pressure lab report or will be. Um, what is the normal systolic arterial blood pressure range between what and what? Because I have covered it and talked about it in lab. 80 to 160. So between 80 to 160, your body, your baroreceptors, your medulla, all that stuff, they think this blood pressure is okay. If your blood pressure is 90, we're good. If your blood pressure is 120, we're good. If it's below 80, if it's above 160, uh-oh, now we got an emergency. Now we must step in. We need a quick fix. We might need a hormonal long fix. But within that range, it's usually constant, all right? So I've mentioned this before. It was even a quiz question. The kidneys filter on average, it can vary depending on body size, five and a half liters of blood every 40 minutes, which is astounding. That's why we can get by with one kidney. They're so darn efficient. Um, don't memorize this either, because if you look at a different textbook, you're gonna get a different value and everything scales to body size. So in general, females have a slightly lower filtration rate, males have a slightly higher, it's really body size. If you have a woman that's bigger than your typical male, they might have a higher filtration rate. So that's the real thing. Now, GFR is constant. Okay, between 80 to 160, because that's not an emergency. That's acceptable fluctuation. It's when it goes outside of those normal ranges that the things we've talked about in the cardiovascular chapter, even way back in chapter one, that's when those kick in. So if it drops below 80, goes above 160, then it's an emergency and there's going to be a quick fix and a long fix. Now I've introduced you, you know, the quick fix. You wrote about it in the lab report. Okay. If it drops below 80, baroreceptors in the aortic arch, carotid artery sense it, send a signal to the medulla. Medulla knows it has to bring that blood pressure up. So it stimulates the cardiac center. And then what happens? If blood pressure is too low, what will the heart rate do? Change it. It's too low, you gotta increase the heart rate. What do your systemic arterioles do? Vasoconstrict or vasodilate? vasoconstrict and blood pressure goes up. And the opposite scenario is if blood pressure is too high, sensors detect, medulla responds with decreased heart rate, the parasympathetic response and vasodilation of the arteries and blood pressure goes down. You know that already. You also know this, and I'm building in gratuitous review because the exam's on Friday and I'm finding out what you've studied. So that's the quick fix. We know from lab, it's only gonna last about 10, 15, 20 seconds max, and then the effect goes away. The long fix, let's start with if arterial blood pressure is too low. The kidneys themselves will sense it. 
The JGA senses it. It's also an integrating sender and effector. It secretes, and I just went through this earlier. What's the hormone the JGA secretes when blood pressure is too low coming into the kidneys? Renin. And then it goes to the liver, goes to the lungs, goes to the adrenal cortex, you get aldosterone. And at the distal convoluted tubule, aldosterone causes you to retain salt in your bloodstream, and then water follows it. Your blood volume goes up because you're retaining water, your blood pressure goes up. See how I'm building in this review? Okay, that's a long fix. That hormone can be in your blood for days. The opposite scenario, blood pressure is too high. Barrel receptors in the heart itself secrete a hormone. What's that hormone? It's a three letter acronym, but it's not ADH. AMP, atrial, remember the heart has atria, natriuretic peptide. AMP goes down to the kidneys and increases filtration rate so that you pee out more body water. That makes your blood volume drop and makes your blood pressure drop. Huh? Bringing it all together? Okay, because I'm definitely gonna be asking about those medulla quick fixes. Renin when blood pressure is too low. AMP when blood pressure is too high. Now, when blood pressure fluctuates, is that the stimulus for ADH secretion? The stimulus for ADH secretion is a change in your blood osmolarity. I'm gonna ask that. I say, which of the following will fix blood osmolarity? Not renin, not necessarily. Not AMP, not necessarily. ADH's role is, if it's only secreted when blood salt content gets too high. All right, so don't, it's not a trick question. I just want you to remember that because you're gonna see it on the exam. Okay, so this is the pathway I was talking about. All right, so if it's between the magic 80 to 160, come on, Penn. Nothing happens, okay? So what I've got in green color-coded it because it helps keep it organized. The line is flat. GFR is steady between 80 to 160. No emergency here, no need to step in. But if it drops below 80 or above 160, we will have things happen. So if it is outside the normal range, the body says that's an emergency. So if blood volume and blood pressure are too high, okay? And that's gonna be the red line, all right? You will have Several things going on. Part of this is review. You will have ANP release by the heart itself, which increases GFR, glomerular filtration rate, so that you pee out body water. And that makes blood volume go down because you're losing body water. And that makes BP, blood pressure, go down because you've lost that water out in your urine, okay? So I've brought together a long fix, a hormonal fix that you wanna know for Friday's exam. And now I'm telling you here, this is what that hormone was doing to GFR. So I'm tying it all together. All right, but I'm not gonna ask on the exam what it does to, you just wanna know that A and P will cause, it's in the notes for chapter, the cardiovascular chapter, increases filtration rate, you pee out body water, your blood volume and blood pressure drop. You just wanna know its effect on blood volume and blood pressure. So I've added this though, cause we're talking about filtration rate. Now, if it drops too low, okay, now we're at the blue. So let's stick with GFR. What happens to GFR in this case? Look at what the line is doing. It's going down. You'll have decreased, see it's going down. We're here, filtration rate's going up. So if you decrease filtration rate, you retain water. That makes blood volume and blood pressure increase. So this is a new fix. The other one ties into the, what we've talked about is ANP release. And now I'm saying this is what it does to filtration rate. But then if blood pressure is too low, filtration rate decreases, you don't filter as much, you retain that water, blood volume, blood pressure go up. What's another thing that can happen? 
other than decreasing filtration rate that we just talked about, what's a, a, a hormonal fix, not a filtration rate fix per se. What's also happening here as a hormonal fix to low blood pressure? We just talked about it. You will have renin release, right? Because that happens when blood pressure is too low. I'm just doing this to review what I'm going to be asking you on Friday, which leads to aldosterone is produced. And then you retain salt and water, which also will increase your blood volume and blood pressure. So you got a couple things going on. When I teach you these things, you think they happen one after another, like if blood pressure is too low. Okay, the medulla is going to increase heart rate and vasoconstrictor artery. And then we're going to have renin release and then we'll have aldosterone. Then you retain salt and water. And then your filtration rate drops. So you retain all these things, all these fixes happen simultaneously. Okay, that's the complexity of the body. All these things are going on at the same time, all right? All right, so is that pretty good review? If I keep going over something and over something and over something in a semester, it's because I really want you to know it. Okay, that's an important one. They're going to want you to know this in nursing. Okay, so another clinical application or nursing application of filtration rate is um, measurements of GFR are used clinically to assess kidney health. There's many things you can measure for to determine if someone's got kidneys are in problem. One is BUN, blood urine nitrogen, way back in the metabolism chapter. There's some new things out that are pretty good too. Another is measuring creatine clearance from the bloodstream. So creatine is produced as a byproduct of normal skeletal muscle or just muscle activity. So you have creatine um, in your blood. Creatine is a waste product, all right? Enters the bloodstream at a constant rate, is normally limited, limited, eliminated by the kidneys at a constant rate. So the renal plasma clearance of creatine is only just a little bit higher than GFR, but it's close enough that if you measure creatine clearance by the kidneys, you can estimate GFR. And GFR tells you how the person's patient's kidneys are functioning along with other kidney tests. So GFR can be measured approximately by the clearance of creatine. And so trust me, these are gonna be the labs that come back on a patient to tell you if their kidney function is okay. So you're gonna see this as nurses. It's gonna be maybe in their patient history um, for you to look at. Okay, now we're coming to the nephrons. And really all I'm gonna want you to know is mostly what is re retained or reabsorbed from the nephron and goes back into circulation. If this was a higher level physiology, I want you to know everything that's retained, uh, uh, secreted and excreted, but I'm just gonna try and keep it simple because this is gonna be introductory for most of you. So I color code everything, PCT in purple, the loop in blue letters, and the DCT in green, and then the collecting duct just put in brown. Okay, so we're gonna talk about each step of that nephron and what is primarily reabsorbed and what's going on at that nephron and just keeping with what's clinically relevant for nurses. So vocabulary, I've used reabsorption before. Reabsorption is the same as retention. That means it goes back into your circulatory system and is kept in your body, all right? So reabsorption is where things leave the filtrate of the tubule of the nephron and go back into general circulation. So the body reclaims it, retains it, reabsorbs it, all those R's, all right? Now, sometimes, and this might be relevant when you get into pharmacology, so keep that in mind, some things are secreted from the bloodstream and put into the filtrate. So here, like let's say pharmacological drugs, a lot of drugs get eliminated by the liver. Some drugs get, especially anesthetics get eliminated by the lungs, but a lot of pharmacological drugs get eliminated through your urine. Okay. So let's say it's a pharmacological drug. It gets secreted from the bloodstream into the filtrate, and then it makes its way out into your urine. So that's secretion. Now, excretion is basically, it's gonna be excreted from the body. It's what is urine that leaves the kidney, goes down the ureter, goes to the bladder, goes to the urethra, leaves your body. So if it's excreted, it's removed from the body as urine. So that's vocab. Okay, these things you'll wanna know in pharmacology, trust me, you'll come back to it. 
those terms. So again, this is an example of reabsorption, retention, reclamation. So we've got, let's see, what's the red one? It is probably salt, yep, sodium, the green glucose, and small amino acids. This is actually factual, okay? At the PCT, the first part of the nephron after the glomerulus, you are gonna retain most of the water that enters as filtrate. Your body doesn't wanna waste that. Regardless of whether you're dehydrated, hydrated, regardless of whether there's ADH, AMP, aldosterone in your bloodstream, at the PCT, about 65% of the filtrates automatically reabsorb. It just happens automatically, all right? And so that's happening there. Water, salts, um, ions, glucose, amino acids, lots of small things immediately go right back into the bloodstream. Oop, too far. Okay. So at the PCT, I like to think of the PCT reabsorbs, bless you, since it's proximal P, it reabsorbs pretty much everything. Okay, I'll put about 65% of filtrate is reabsorbed here. Okay. Regardless of whether you're hydrated or have hormones in your blood, those things do not affect this. It happens automatically. All right. Now at the Henley's loop, the loop of Henley, there's going to be this thing called a countercurrent multiplication system. Most textbooks make it really complicated and it isn't. And I'll explain it later as simply as I can. Um, but basically, the Henley's loop will allow water on one side of the loop to be reabsorbed and on the other side, salt. Now, at the distal convoluted tubule, it's the last official tubule of the nephron, and this is where aldosterone has its effect. It, it increases increased salt retention to increase water retention. Okay, and then the collecting duct, oops is where ADH has its effect. This is the last place for any hormone, which is ADH, to have its effect on water retention, the last place. Aldosterone doesn't have an effect here, AMP doesn't have an effect here. It has an effect at the filtration of the glomerulus. So this is the last place where your urine can be modified before it leaves your body. Because once it leaves the collecting duct, the collecting duct merges with the minor calyx or calyces of your kidney, then to the major calyx, and that merges with the ureter, and it is leaving the kidneys to leave your body. All right. So that's kind of the quick thing about what's going on at the nephrons. If I go a little more detailed, I am more focused with this. Okay. I'll have this here, things that are secreted but I'm not gonna test you on an exam on that, but you probably wanna know it in nursing or we'll come back to it in nursing in pharmacology, okay? The PCT, 65% of the water, which makes up the majority of your filtrate. Ions are very important. Now, I'll add this one here. Okay, it's right there. I mentioned this before. At the very beginning of this PowerPoint, I talked about how your kidneys regulate pH, and I said it regulates it by excreting in urine hydrogen ions, which are acidic, which is why your urine is acidic, and then retaining bicarbonate in your bloodstream because it's a buffer. Bicarbonate is a buffer for the CO2 waste product that you have circulating in your blood, okay? Um, by the way, don't write it down, just a little factoid, because I talked about urinary tract infections, and I'll talk about urinary stones. Your urine is supposed to be slightly acidic, and that's a good thing because the urethra, especially in women whose urethra is short and wide, it's easy for bacteria, pathogens, yeast, and things like that to get in that urethra. If the urine is nice and acidic, whenever you pee, you're flushing that stuff out. If anything happens, maybe what you eat or metabolize, or this is, sounds weird, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Um, there's lots of feminine products out there to make you smell fresh. Don't douche out the vagina's natural flora and, and things like that, because now you're going to set yourself up for a urinary tract infection. They have all these fragrances and stuff like that. Well, the vagina is a self-cleaning organ, my friends. 
Okay, and so is the urethra. Um, so anyway, if you change your diet and your urine becomes alkaline, that can actually, acid is not friendly to bacteria. Acid will kill bacteria. So an acidic urethra, when we talk about the immune system, is a good thing because if bacteria did get in there, the acidic urine is going to flush it away, okay? If your pH of your urine changes to more alkaline, now the bacteria are like, hey, all right? So yeah, um, that's when problem set in is when someone's pH becomes alkaline. That's also where crystals like to precipitate out of solution is in alkaline pH urine. But that's kind of advanced. But since I saw the pH, the hydrogen ions being excreted, urine's acidic, that is a protective barrier to pathogens getting into your urinary tract system. Now, glucose. The PCT is the only place that glucose can be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. If I went into a higher level physiology, I'd say there's a certain number of glucose receptors at the PCT. If you have a high amount of glucose in your bloodstream because you have diabetes or something else is messing with your glucose metabolism, the glucose that enters as filtrate into the PCT is gonna overwhelm the set number of receptors you have for it, and it overwhelms them. It simply cannot reabsorb all the glucose that's in the filtrate, thus glucose makes it past the T PCT. No other place in the nephron can reabsorb glucose, so it ends up in your urine, which is abnormal, all right? We're not supposed to be secreting a large amount of glucose in our urine. That's indicative of diabetes and small proteins. And look here, the creatine, all right, does get secreted into filtrate. I'm not going to ask you where does creatine get secreted, but all I want you to know about creatine is creatine clearance rate is almost equal to GFR. That's all I want you to know about that. Okay. So stay focused on the left side of this table. All right. How are we doing? Good. Okay. Moving on to the loop. So the descending loop, okay, put in pink, obviously, um, it's permeable to water, but not salt. So water can cross the tubule and get into your bloodstream, but not salt. It's got no receptors for salt. So just remember the descending loop is for water. I haven't come up with a neat way to remember descending in water. Maybe you'll come up with one. All right. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Now the, here's where we get to how your urine is concentrated. This side of the loop only allows water out. I'll show you on the next slide, okay? On the ascending side, only salt is allowed across the tubule back into your bloodstream. So that's why it's called counter current because what this side of the loop is doing is different from this side. But let's do this. I'm gonna explain the counter current multiplication system. If this side allows for the reabsorption of salt, 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 okay? lots and lots and lots of salt. That makes the environment around the loop salty because all the salt is being pulled out by the ascending side. So now outside of the membrane of the loop, it's a hypertonic environment. Think of the dialysis tubing in the lab experiment. If the outside of the environment is very salty and there's water in the filtrate of the tubule, I, you know that I just told you that, does water follow the salt out into that interstitial space? Yeah. And that water is coming out here. Because all of this is salty, water gets pulled out of the descending loop. And now with water being pulled out of the filtrate inside the tubule, it becomes more concentrated because water has just been removed. That's how your urine's concentrated. Eh? That's not too complicated, right? It's pretty simple. And basically that, because there's a capillary plexus around it, that salt and water can be reabsorbed into your bloodstream. And mind you, I'll make a line here. That is the end of the autonomic auto reabsorption of materials. Things are autonomically auto-regulated, pulled out of the PCT, pretty much everything. And then salt and water is pulled out of the filtrate at the loop in this counter current system automatically, regardless of your state of hydration or if there's hormones in your blood. After this line, hormones will have their effect. But pretty much 
90 plus percent of the filtrate automatically gets returned to your bloodstream regardless of anything. But after this point, if there's aldosterone, it'll have its effect here. You retain a little more salt, a little more water. And if you have ADH in your bloodstream, it'll have its effect here and you'll retain more water. All right, so that's just a concept. So this is how complicated they make the countercurrent multiplication system, right? Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer that one or do you prefer that one? I prefer the previous one because that's really what's going on. If this was a higher level physiology class, you'd be talking about aquaporin channels and receptors and we're not doing that. We're going to move right along. Okay, the DCT. This is permeable to salt if aldosterone is present. So if salt is retained, if salt is retained, you know this now, water is retained. And that happens pretty much about that last part of the DCT right there, all right? So if your blood pressure is too low, the JGA secretes renin, renin goes to the liver, some things get converted, then something goes to the lungs and things get converted. And then something goes to the adrenal cortex and you get your aldosterone, has its effect there. You pull salt back into your bloodstream. You pull water back into your bloodstream. Your blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up. All right. Okay, and then the last part of the nephron, I can't believe we've covered the entire nephron physiology already, but it's pretty simple, is, oh, since we're talking about aldosterone, these things I covered in the cardiovascular chapter, didn't I? I also covered them in the endocrine system, right? So know that Addison's, oops, back. Addison's disease is low aldosterone, okay? I could ask a question, I can't remember. Go by the exam breakdown that I emailed to you. Right now, I can't even remember because I sent it out. God, I sent that out weeks ago, didn't I? I think I sent it out before break. I don't even know. No, it wasn't before break. But anyway, do know. Addison's disease, no con syndrome was it's excess aldosterone because, well, we're talking about aldosterone and its effect on the distal convoluted tubule. Plus you're studying for it anyway. Now the DCT from our lab last week is affected by ADH. When blood osmolarity rises, for some of you who drink the saline solution or maybe eat a ream of saltines or whatever, Pringles, chips, eat a couple slices of pizza, your blood salt's gonna go up. And 30 minutes later, that's how long it takes, aldosterone, I'm sorry, ADH is released. And you can have more water pulled out of your collecting duct that goes back into your bloodstream, okay? Now, ADH's role is to fix high blood osmolarity. Its goal is not to, mess with blood pressure, but it does as a side effect. So don't be thrown by that. Yes, if you retain water, yeah, if you retain water, your BP can increase, but it dilutes the salts in your blood to decrease osmolarity. That was ADH's goal because the stimulus for its secretion was not a change in blood pressure. It was a rise in your blood osmolarity. That's the only reason it's secreted. If blood pressure is too low or too high, you're not going to have ADH secreted. The hypothalamus is not paying attention to that. Okay. The medulla does, but not the hypothalamus. Okay. Any questions so far? Because we're, we're moving right along. I promise I'll be getting to some more applicable stuff to nursing here shortly. Okay, Oop. Okay. I guess I didn't need to say that. So can I get rid of it now? It won't let me get rid of it now. It's okay. Okay, for the people in lab that drank water, you had ADH inhibition. Without ADH in your bloodstream, you're not retaining water from the collecting duct. That filtrate goes right on through the collecting duct as urine. So you lose that extra water you drank that is in your bloodstream, you pee that out. Okay, if you want to review vocabulary and everything that I just went over today, because sometimes a YouTube video does a good job, it's not even a long one, three minutes and 30 seconds, you can click here 
it's a really good YouTube video explaining the things that I just talked about. I don't feel the need to go over it because I just covered it. But if you want to on your own when you're looking at the PowerPoint online, it's a pretty darn good video. Okay, so we've covered woo a lot. So now comes common urinary problems that you're going to encounter on the daily as nurses. Oh, review, built in review. Now, we've covered a lot of this today. You need to know this for Friday, but this, not so much. This is new. Okay. But since blood volume and blood pressure are regulated by the kidneys, your kidneys have the most profound effect on that blood volume and blood pressure. Okay. Yeah, I know what your heart does and what your arteries do can affect it too, but that effect is going to be very short. Okay. So if blood pressure is too low, you know you end up needing to make it high. What does the medulla do? What does it stimulate? So it's sensed by the baroreceptors, signals the medulla. What does the medulla's cardiac center do to fix this? Be confident. What's your heart rate do? Increases your heart rate. Yes. Our lab on blood pressure shows that when your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Okay. What else happens that we couldn't measure in the lab? Arteries constrict, artery vasoconstriction. Okay, that will increase your blood pressure temporarily. Now, um, what do the kidneys do? That's a long fix. That's another word for hormonal fix. What do the kidneys do when arterial blood pressure is coming in from the renal artery and it's too low? And the JGA is a sensor integrating center and effector, and it's going to secrete something. What secretes renin? And after a long pathway to the liver, lungs, adrenal cortex, you'll get aldosterone secretion, which we just talked about. Aldosterone has its effect at the DCT. You retain salt, you retain water. Okay, that will increase your blood pressure. Now, if blood pressure is too low, think of the diagram I gave you, okay? Okay, 80, 160. What happens to filtration rate if blood pressure is too low? It goes down. GFR decreases, so you retain filtrate. I'll just say retain water. All of this will increase blood pressure effect. So you are studying for Friday, the short fix. Oh, you can put it there, the short fix or quick fix. And we did a lab on this. And you're studying the long fix, which would be this case, all right? Now this I introduced today, all of them will increase your blood pressure because the problem is it's too low. Now just kind of reverse some of these things. If blood pressure is too high, you know you need to bring it back down. Now what does the medulla do? Decrease heart rate and artery vasodilation, which will definitely drop your blood pressure. Now the heart has baroreceptors too. It's a sensor, integrating center, and effector. It secretes what hormone? It's a three-letter acronym. It begins with an A, but it's not ADH, A and P secretion. And then what does that do to filtration rate? Now, if blood pressure is too high, we're right here. What's the line doing? Going up, increase filtration rate. You will pee, out. so that will pee out body water. And the end effect, equals a drop in blood pressure. So we have the quick fix right here, the long fix, which is a hormonal reaction, and then what the kidneys are doing themselves with filtration rate. Is that, is that good review for Friday? Because if you get it wrong in the exam, I'm gonna kick you up with all this review, okay? But that's, that's what's going on. But I'm bringing a lot of things together and I do help that going over and over, kind of helps you out a little bit. Because that's how you need to study go over it and over it and over it. and eventually like, yeah we know Dr. Barbo but I want you to be like that at the end of the semester like I want to be so ingrained in your head that it never leaves 
Okay, we have time for maybe just this one um, common urinary disorder. So urinary stones, and I call them urinary stones, not kidney stones, because they can form anywhere in your urinary tract. And it's called urolithiasis. The uro is for urine, and lithiasis means stone. Right? So it literally means urine stone. So especially if your urine is more alkaline than it should be, um, salt crystals, like calcium, phosphate, triple phosphate, uric acid, which is present in gout, um, will precipitate out of solution in the urine. And once one crystal forms, it's like um, inorganic chemistry. All right? I don't know if you ever had any labs where you uh, precipitate salts out of a solution. But once a crystal forms, it pulls more crystals out of solution and then they stick together and the crystals are very sharp. I should have brought the urinary stones I pulled out of dogs um, to, to class, maybe um, on Monday, cause we'll have to wrap this up on Monday. Um, and you can actually see what these urinary stones look like. They're sharp and edgy. And as they go through your urinary tract, they scrape everything. And that's what can cause blood in your urine. Um, the calculi can actually block the urine from leaving your kidneys right here. And that builds up tremendous fluid pressure because the urine's continually being produced. And that fluid pressure can kill your kidneys. Notice this kidney has been removed from a patient because the kidney died, okay? If it makes it down the ureter, it can certainly block in the ureter. If it gets it into the bladder, I've seen a dog with a bladder stone that almost took the entire volume of the bladder. It had to be surgically removed because there was no way we could um, insert a catheter into the bladder and break it up. It was just too large. And you'll see that with humans too, left untreated. Um, if it gets down out of the bladder, it can get blocked in the urethra, which I talked about before, and you can't pee. Or when you do pee, it's extremely painful because those crystals are going to do this through the urethra, scratch, and cause blood and discomfort. I've heard people say, and I'll leave you on this thought, that passing a kidney stone is as painful as childbirth. I have no reference for this. But I've known a lot of people that have passed a kidney stone like faculty right here at FMU. So it's very common. You're going to see it. Good luck on Friday. If you have any questions, you can email me. But on Thursday evening at 8 o'clock, I'm like, I'm going to be having a glass of wine. I'm going to be checked out. Okay. So have questions before that if you have them. Thanks.